Yeah, dude, I'm from the same place Brett Kavanaugh is from. Chevy Chase, Maryland. Are I'm, you kidding? It's like white, so, whitey central, man. And, and I don't mean like whitey bulger, whitey. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Boston. And, and are you, are you, uh, are you actually, um, you know that for a long By time. By the way, I, I don't support Brett Kav Kavanaugh. <laughs> I just want to be, be clear about that. You know that when I was going for my master's and I saw Chevy Chase, I was like, Oh, I didn't know that he was really that famous. I don't, think that's city <laughs> after him, right? I don't even think that's his real name. Yeah. No, it's it's named. It's a it's a I battle. Thought... It's a battle in a Scottish chase. In Scottish means uh, like a meadow. You know, for the longest time, for like a semester, I thought that they named Chevy Chase Maryland after the comedian. I was like, he must have been their own, born and raised, you know, hometown guy. So they named Chevy Chase after him. That's what I that's thought. Great. So in any event. Uh, the, some of the young people don't, might not know, the British people might not know that there's an actor called Chevy Chase. Right? Everybody knows Chevy. Very funny. Know Very funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fletch, uh, Spies Like Us. Yeah. Okay, so you grew up there. Uh, yeah, I was born in... Uh, and I your was parents are from Maryland, too. So. No, my, my parents, my dad's from uh, New York. He's a New Yorker. My mom Which is part of New York? Uh, Manhattan and then Oneonta. Which is up... State? Yeah, Oneonta somewhere like way upstate. They have okay. a SUNY campus there. Yeah, okay. they have a SUNY in Oneonta. And, and your mom? My mom is from New Haven, Connecticut. Her dad was a professor oh, I lived at Yale. In New Haven. Okay. Yeah. So your mom was an academic. Though, right? My mom was an anthropologist. Yeah, she worked as an academic for a while, and then she did her PhD in anthropology at Cambridge, and then she worked as a professor for a little while at American University, and then she went into development work. She Which means what? Like uh, doing charity, not charity, but doing like working with, uh, you know, NGOs. And later on in her career, she worked for the World Bank and for Exxon Mobil doing corporate responsibility because they were doing uh, drilling for oil in Chad where she had done her dissertation. And so, so she went and studied the people of Chad in Africa. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So and your dad, what did he do? My dad worked for the World Bank. Actually, the funny thing is to this day can't actually tell you what my dad's <laughs> job was I, I mean i can tell you his titles but i don't know what his quote-unquote job but was. Like in what the world did. bank he's not a banker he was a division chief okay and he worked on infrastructure energy and the environment before that he went to harvard business school before that he was in the peace corps uh with my mom in chad to avoid going to vietnam because he was not so in, you're not your in vietnam academia sort of runs in the family then uh, yeah, actually, my both my mom's parents were professors. One was a physics. My, my grandfather had two PhDs: one in physics, one in chemistry. My grandmother had a PhD in history of science. And then you're you have siblings, or you yeah, I have two sisters. And you're the youngest. No, I'm the oldest. Kate, the oldest. Kate, and Lucinda. Okay, you're the oldest. Yeah, they changed their names. Like they, they got ma they changed their names so fast after they got married. Like, like the first email I got from them, like right after they got married, was like from another email, another <laughs> name. I was stunned. I'm the last. I'm the last of the bro Brohicans. So you actually, so you actually stayed in the area and went to Georgetown, which is right. right well, I went door. to Georgetown for college, but I went to high school in California. I went to high school. That you're like this. In a little town in California, no one knows about except me and Hamza Yusuf. Really? Because she, Hamza Yusuf, because he went to boarding school in the same town. Oh, it's really? called Ojai, California. So you went to this boarding school? Was no, it like we, some he, we went thing? to rival. We went to rival boarding schools. Mm. I, I know mean, about Ojai. <laughs> you been? You know about Ojai? Yeah. Wow! Yeah. I didn't know anyone. And, knew about and what is it? Some fancy school or what? Uh it's pretty nice. Uh, let's just say it's. Let's just say I couldn't afford to send my kids there, even. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's like you know, fifty k a year. Okay, it's one of those, and it's almost like what is it in the league of Andover and those schools? Yeah, I think so. It's usually in the top ten uh, boarding schools in the country. Okay. And then you came back out east to go to college. Then I went to came back to Georgetown to college. And then with all this, how you end up becoming Muslim at, at a time when it wasn't like in the media, it wasn't something yeah. people were thinking about. It's 97, right? 1997. But yeah. congratulations. We, you just had your 20th. Uh, 21st? Something, yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, it's interesting. I've been now Muslim longer than I was not Muslim. And yeah. I actually, I've been reading just for my class on Tuesday, I've been reading The Road to Mecca, Muhammad Assad, which mm -hmm. I hadn't read since I read that book before I became Muslim. And mm. it was one book where it really had a big impact on me. Wow. Uh, so rereading it now is fascinating. That's it's cool. Having actually gone to a lot of the places he's gone, he'd gone to in the book. No, so what's, where is your mind going from being, doing, living that type of life? I mean, in you a boarding been a school. Supreme Court judge, so. Yeah, I was, uh, your... <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I was, I don't know, I was not, uh, I was not in, on a good path. I, I had a lot of, uh, existential angst in high school i mean i was really almost incapacitated by how how unsure i was about my place in the universe how 
so when I when I when I started university, I was just my brain was revving. I was so I was so eager to learn. And um, uh, Georgetown has a theology requirement, so I had to take two theology classes. I took one on the biblical literature. I took a second one. I just chose randomly about Islam. And uh, and then the the, the teacher, uh, her name is, I was telling you yesterday about this, Mesa al Faruqi. She's the niece of Ismail al Faruqi, one of the founders of Triple IT. And uh, this she, class. She's still, still teaching there? No, I don't know where she is. Actually, I just emailed her the other day because I was reading Road to Mecca. And I was like, I need to email her. Uh, and this, uh, I mean, the way she taught, she said in the class, she's like, look, I'm gonna t- I want you to step into shoes of a Muslim for this class, yeah. you know? And by the, even like halfway through the class, I was like, this is, I was like, this is what I believe. I said, I even when I talked to her, I said, this is, I feel like the stuff you're teaching is what I believe. And she's like, you have to choose what to do. This is your choice. And, um, but then, you know, I subhanAllah, man, I think about the people who went through her class. There's so many, people don't know this, but a lot of big prominent Muslims today went through that, went through Professor Faruqi's class. Like who? Um, I don't, I don't, maybe I don't want to, I don't want to like, I don't know, is it right to say people who were in the class? I mean, is that, is that do you think it's ethical? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess. Yeah, you might be telling their story our, for them. Our roster is yeah, uh, public information. No, well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell one person for sure. I mean, uh, Sh- uh, Carl uh, Sharif al Tubgi is a professor at Brandeis. Yeah. He, he went through her class, and she had a big impact on him. Wow. Sure. Uh, and there's a lot of other. I, I, I don't want to. I'm just going to I'm just gonna uh, not say their names because usually my mouth is too big, and I'm going to use my, let my brain mm-hmm. control my mouth here. But, I mean, there's a lot of people, Muslims, who are uh, either very prominent or, or just, like, you know, really solid Muslims. Either people who converted or who were, you know, who really moved by by her teaching. Masha Allah. Really, that's impressive. My wife took her class too. Yeah. Zubham. Uh, Zubham. So let, let's get yeah. to the most Slavery. interesting part. No, the most interesting part of no. the bio. For, so uh, a lot of intelligent Muslims converts I know gravitate towards the Hanbali school. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, like I didn't know like that. very smart people like yourself, mm-hmm. or like. Uh, Musa Ferber, he yeah. was a chef, but he initially was. Yeah, uh, he was my teacher. Yeah. So, mm. what what is it about the Hamley School that uh, attracts smart people? Mm. I don't know. I mean, I uh, the fact that it's not makruh to urinate standing up <laughs> that uh, that was a big thing for I me mean, <laughs> in the Maliki uh, School. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, then uh, you can wipe over cloth socks. Mm. Yeah. But I think you know. I don't know. I think. Uh, I don't know. I have a weird feeling like maybe that it's a minority school and that I think, you know, intellectuals always like to be a minority. They always like to be contrarian. And yeah. I think that might be part of it. But I, I also think that uh, just the, the, you know, it really kind of sticks close to Nusus. I mean, it sticks close to texts in a way that I think the other methods don't. Hmm. And, I, and I'm not saying in, and I, I don't believe any school is superior to the other. Uh, but this no, was that was my inclination. Yeah. Uh, I thought that that's probably why, because it is it's very it's very textual. And I also, I had the chance, you know, at the, when I was learning about this stuff, the Musa was uh, Sheikh Musa was in um, in Egypt. I had the opportunity to study Mashallah. with him. So I he's, was, is he older? He's older than me. I think he's maybe about ten years older than me. Maybe. Oh, okay. So uh, he's, oh, I guess, a veteran by now. Yeah. So I've, I've I talked saw, to him a couple I times. I didn't realize. I saw a picture of him the was. other day. He had like his beard was was significantly white it was Mashallah. gray but he's um, and he's putting out books now like one a year yeah one every six months translations yeah. and really beneficial no he's uh, I really I like uh, I have a lot of yeah. affection for him and um, you know it's funny we started out as enemies online on really online. we used to argue on, online all the time really nastily and the on funny what thing forums is, back in the day? Back in the day, there was this thing called M E I S G S. Oh, that the, stupid email. <laughs> yeah, they, back back in the day, back in the two thousands, yeah. it was a good, a good. Then it got kind of taken over by. After nine eleven, it got taken over. No, no, it was it was not. It was, it was only after nine eleven that it was started. It was uh, it was taken over kind of the progressive, progressive voices. Progressive Muslim Union, yeah. And I mean, the problem with the progressive Muslims is they is that is that a lot of them they just don't they don't want to debate stuff, and yeah. you can't you can't really have discussions with them. Uh, and so eventually someone put me on that for like six months and I just like took off so he was on we would argue a lot and then you know we met the funny thing is every time I meet I argue someone in in online I end up like really liking them in person yeah so we met in person and like we got along very well that's cool all right now slavery firstly it's been like 10 minutes the Nazmo is up there someone needs to go (laughs) go check out (laughs) what's going on he's boiling the water 
Uh, so slavery. So yeah. so this is this is the the latest book that you've uh, that you've written. It's about slavery and Islam. Yeah. Right? Slavery and Islam. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's a pretty um, uh, so you know when I the, b- b- why did I write this book? So when I was like okay, what are the big things? What are the two big things that Muslims struggle with? I would say the four thirty four daughter uh, wife, wife beating. Absolutely, that one. <laughs> and uh, slavery. Those are the two. Like those are the two things that when I go and talk to young Muslims, like if they if they're really courageous, they these are the questions they ask. And I don't mean because they're afraid to ask those questions. They're mm-hmm. afraid of the answers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wanted to like I want to deal with this stuff. I want to deal with them for myself. Like I wanted I wanted the answers for this. Subhanallah. Nesmos has returned I, with I the coffee, like with a cup. What are you? Are you gonna? Ch- are you checking it no, out I to make? First thing, I gotta drink. He's your. He's your poison taster. <laughs> I hope it's good. I'm sure it's good. Critical. Yeah. It's critical. The French press is really hard to mess up. Yeah. So the um, so the the, the my misquoting Muhammad <laughs> book, the last chapter, which I noticed you have on your bookshelf, mm-hmm. Doctor Shadi. I got that. The uh, the last chapter is all is all about the wife, wife birth beating, right? Yeah. And Every, everyone should have that book, and mainly it's the last few chapters that they need to read. Ahmed, you should get that. You would love that. Yeah, it'd be great if we get a just a sneak peek, of yeah. kind of get of the, order the, order the book, and and it's the last few chapters cover all these issues. I mean, uh, so that you mean you want to know the answer to the a wife beating, or just yeah, maybe a high level kind of the way we overview. I mean, I w- I would say. Th- I mean, it's boy. I don't know. If it's been it's been so long since I've thought about that issue. But I mean, I, I would say that you know, you the way that the Quran is read. So when we when we think about um, reading it, interpreting a text, right? So if I said, you know, like if we if I picked up this this card, it said, you know, um, go drink coffee. Right? So if I were to think that this meant don't drink coffee. That would be like, what are you talking about? Like, don't drink coffee. Like, what are you, that doesn't make any sense. How did you get this interpretation? But the way that the, the, the Quran is read is that the viability or persuasiveness of an interpretation isn't based on the closeness of that meaning to the text, the evident meaning of the text. It's based on whether it's supported by the Sunnah of the Prophet. Mm, I said so. Right? So you have the 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 the, the verse four thirty four and four thirty five. They it's it's read as if you know if you if you're certain that your wife is going to engage in kind of egregious disobedient conduct towards you first admonish her then don't sleep with her anymore then strike her. Uh, that this seems to be just the steps you're supposed to follow, but uh, from the Sunnah of the Prophet, we know very clearly without any doubt that. Uh, this last thing is incre- incredibly discouraged. That the only the, that the best of you would never do this. And there's rule and there's rules around what is it's even rules possible. Are rest- restrict to, the prophet yeah. restricts what you can do, right? Um, and then of course the next the the real that verse is usually gets a little bit of discussion, but the real discussion Muslims engage in scholars engage in, is on the next verse, which is about arbitration between a couple. So the the real effort is put on how do you arbitrate between a couple that's having a dispute now what so what i said is like this is you know uh you this is that is the 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 prophetic understanding of this and everybody knows the prophetic understanding is you don't act on this now the the question is why do you have a verse that says something when the prophet's basically saying don't do this thing and the um my my interpretation you know i think the honest interpretation is that uh, in our society, it's in our society is unacceptable to strike your wife. If you ever had this urge, what stopped you? And I want to know why. My suspicion, my suspicion is, it would be, what would people say? I would be one of those guys, right? It's not about. It's not suddenly like this pure light of morality shines into your brain and you say like why do we why what is right and wrong to us it's what it's what's expected to, from us it's what are people going to say right that's orf so 
the the in, in our society this is completely unacceptable and so if 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 america was taken over by sharia law i'm not saying that's going to happen or that anyone's planning that right but the, <laughs> if america if suddenly there were sharia courts in america and i struck my wife she could take me to court and say my husband hit me he's caused me harm and i want a divorce and the judge would say it would do t would okay. end our marriage do tafriq because this is unacceptable in our society okay there are other societies where it's not that it's just not that uh controversial mm -hmm. but i think you made a great point here for for um, for the listeners really if if they're struggling with this subject um that if you actually applied the sharia law and this was done to a woman that she would get her rights well right? it depends yeah, it, it, so it, depends. Get compensation no, but it, de it depends right so if you're in a society where like americans like America, if, if you if if uh if i hit my wife god forbid right if i hit my wife and she went to a sharia court she could this 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 is darar darar is harm harm is defined by culture she could say i've been harmed this guy has harmed me in a way i want compensation i want a divorce etc cetera, etc cetera. and he and i'd have to pay the full dowry everything if you're in a society where this is not that big like for like south, south america or something this is simply not as big a deal and uh, uh you know one of my teachers uh, in egypt ali juma who's with who's with whose politics i disagree strongly but you know he's a great scholar uh, he says that the quran is revealed to uh all times and all places and there are some societies where this is acceptable and even if you were to say even if you were to say that no at no time other than the, the society of the prophet was this accepted then it would still have been that one even if this verse was just revealed for one person in one time it would have been acceptable for that one person in one time and that's hard i think that's hard for people to accept even that idea is hard for people to accept but even if you take an example like south america not to pick on south americans but uh islamically you're not allowed to hit, hit in the face right so if, yeah, yeah, if the husband to, was to do to... that even if you went to in, in in sharia law in south america that or because of islam islam's rules around things like this that would be completely unacceptable yeah for a man so to any, do. any i mean you can look at the you look at the just the hadiths on this don't strike your don't strike the face no blow that leaves any mark right you know uh, the best of you will never strike your wife so they I mean that it creates this fence around it um and what's interesting, so in the last chapter of the book, I go, what I, what I say is, like, the, who are the ultimate interpreters of, Islam, of the Quran? The ultimate interpreters of the Quran are Islamic courts on this issue. So I actually look in court cases, go, going, and I find some examples, for example, in the 1300s and 1400s, 900s, uh, in the 20th century, in the 19th century. So I find lots of examples. And, and uh, sure enough, what's always the case? If a woman goes and says, my husband hit me, the judge said, gives, get, makes the husband pay compensation. If she wants to, he, he ends the marriage. She gets to keep the dowry. And only in one case, it's interesting, it's in Mali, I think, in the late, late 19th century, the guy says, wait, the Quran allows me to do this. And the judge doesn't care. He says, no, no, this is not like you. Your, your wife is here complaining to me. That this, what your rights are, are, are irrelevant at this point, right? You've you your wife is now so upset with you and believes she's been harmed i know how to deal with this now this is you didn't have a right to cause her harm where was this in mali it was a mali. it was a french what century it was, it was the 19th century i mean you'll see this all in uh, uh french in, court or muslim court? it was a muslim court, muslim court but under french colonial rule but they, yeah. the muslim family law was just and how many there. other court cases did you see like that um tell us well, the location and the yeah and the, so and the one century. i mean one some of them are not uh court cases they are uh like fatwas okay. about this issue um some from uh, cordoba in the 900s uh from northern iran in the 900s one from mardin i believe in which is now you know, now in uh, syria or turkey i think it's in turkey uh in the 1300s and uh some from the ottoman period so 1600s 1700s and then a uh, number uh, one from zanzibar in the 19th century one from mali in the, and two from mali in, in the 19th century and the, just to round out this this topic oh and saudi arabia in the 20th century hmm. um 
the the disobedience that's referred to in the verse is is there a, is there a consensus or a general view of what that encompasses so this is interesting uh Khalid Abu Fadl has a really good discussion of this and um I can't remember what book it was uh he he discusses it in two of his books he argues that the nishus I mean, so men can also be guilty of nishus. In the Quran, it also talks about the nishus of men. And he, he, he makes the argument, I think it's pretty convincing, that nishus is, is it's not just uh, disrespect and disobedient behavior, but it's it's like sexually, kind of sexually egregious and, uh, and, and kind of sexually traitorous behavior. I mean, it's, your, your, your wife is going out and, you know, I don't, you know, Sitting on, I don't, know, I don't even want to think about this. But you know, like I don't want to give voice to whatever weird scenario is going to come into my mind. But yeah. you know, basically, it's not just you know, my wife. Uh, I told her to make me coffee and she didn't do it. I mean, yeah. it's like yeah. it's really I read, egregious. I read one one. Uh, it might it might have been from uh, Doctor Tyler's book where uh, it's like you come home and there's like a guy sitting in your bedroom. You didn't even witness anything, but he's there, and you go, "Don't do this anymore." And then every you come home from work unexpectedly, and the dude yeah, is and by the way, house. remember, remember, you've t yeah. now you've said, "Don't do this again," and probably very forcefully, right? You, you yeah. said, <laughs> "You said, excuse me, uh, please do not do this again," right? So then she does it again, and what do you do? But most guys would be like, "I'm out of here, I divorce you." No, no, but you're sticking to it. Then you say, "You know what? I'm going to go sleep in the other bedroom." Yeah. Yeah. Guys in there again. <laughs> then instead of saying, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm gonna go stay with Shaddy. You, you're like, I'm gonna stick with it. Guys in there again. I, right. So like, this is another thing that has given me is like most people are already gonna divorce their spouse before they follow yeah. even one and two. I, I think when you practically go through it, very few people would actually disagree at that point that this is getting, you know, it, it's, a, it's a difficult, and, very difficult situation, and things like that may happen. And I apologize, it kind of went off a tangent no, no. off of slavery, but no, no. I make it a point to talk to as many non-Muslims about Islam as possible. And aside from the overall aura of terrorism linked with Islam, this is the single biggest thing yeah. that everyone keeps telling me they have a problem with More than in polygamy? Islam. More than polygamy. Polygamy is nothing, man. This nothing. is 2000, 2018. <laughs> every, every man understands polygamy. Yeah. Every woman, if you at least talk it through logically and she's, she wants to actually understand the logic of it. Oh, wait, hang up. I've, I've always wanted to do this. I don't understand polygamy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm a good guy. That's right. You guys suck. <laughs> but I think your wife probably knows that you're uh, faking it. <laughs> this, this one verse really, really scares a lot of women about Islam. And men use it to scare women mm. and kind of put down Islam. Yeah. Even though they may be doing well, God knows what. But I mean, I mean the stats are that, The way I've understood it is, you know, the word, uh, the, uh, the word for Darab also appears on وَلِيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمْرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُوِبِهِنَّ let them strike with their scarves on top of their uh, the the breast element part of their shirt. So that means to touch, right? To touch, because no striking happening with that. So that means there should be contact with the scarf on top of the shirt, in the chest area of the shirt of the shirt. So what I've understood is that if she if you see new shoes, that means this egregious mis misbehavior. Then you first talk about it. Then you first threaten, all right, to that to not be in the same room with them. And then thirdly, you change it with your hand. And it links up with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. If you see a munkar, change it with your hand, right? All right. So you change it with your hand physically. So let's say, I mean, you got you didn't want to mention uh, things, right? But I'll actually give just give an example. A lot of people do crazy things on the internet, right? A lot of people, you walk in, and this uh, woman, for some reason, she's doing crazy things on the internet. You talk about it first, right? Now, like you said, the first thing, something's getting broken for 90% of the time, <laughs> immediately. Right? Yeah. Uh, so something, a laptop, an, object, a not, an object, not a bone. Not, not a bone, bone. Okay. an object. Clear. But let's say you, 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 you follow this through, you talk about it. Listen, we, we got to talk about this. You're not doing this. Third thing, okay, well, I'm going to go spend a night in the, uh, in the living room or the motel. Mind the right? way, she's already, she's done this again, right? That's she did it again. Thing, right? Yeah, she did it again. Now, now, at this point, after you've talked and done these steps, right? You, you you change it with your hand, right? So you 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 take you don't necessarily need to change her, but you're also changing whatever device or object is being misused, right? 
But here's so, the, I mean, here's another I mean, question. That's, a, that's an understanding that's totally but here, makes here's sense. But here's a question. I mean, this is more like American social question. And, and I, I want to, you know, this is just uh, um, uh, hypothetical. I mean, not just, it's just a, a question. I'm not making a statement or anything. But, you know, you see these, sometimes they have these videos on YouTube. And it'll be, I remember one, it was like this, this, um, it's a couple in a parking lot. The guy's like this big dude, you know, looks like a Russian guy or something like that. And he's got this girlfriend and she's just wailing on him. Yeah. I mean, like, way, I mean, just bap, 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 you know, hit, hit hitting hit. him. Like, I mean, just going to town on him. He's yeah. just standing there, standing there, standing there. I mean, this goes on for maybe like 30, 40 seconds. And then he just goes, oh, bam. I mean, not, and she's just down on the ground, yeah. like unconscious, you know. And he's like, goes over her, he's worried about her and stuff. But so here's my question, which is, you know, what's, uh, why is it okay for women to hit men? I mean, I, I, it's we've we've seen, we've established it's not acceptable in our society for men to hit women. I mean, we've accepted that, but why is it acceptable for now women? Now you're making, but, but, but why why would well, why would we accept that today when we're all about equality? But if everybody's that, equal, then why should we accept that men? I honestly, hit women? honestly, I think and like and if women, I mean, like just just yesterday or two days ago, Kareem Hunt, who's a an amazing running back of the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, TMZ released a video of a woman going at him. And there, someone's holding her back, and someone's holding him back. She keeps coming at him. He pushes her. She keeps coming at him. He gets really upset, chases her, pushes her, and then as she's lying on the ground, pushed, he actually pushed like he a pushed guard. someone into uh, her. Yeah. Like I mean, but he didn't do like any major damage to her. And then walks over and kind of kicks her, but not like a football player would kick someone. He he was very light. He loses his job and millions of dollars right away. But if I, I'm okay with that because I believe he shouldn't do that. But I also don't believe that you should say men and women are equal in every single thing. But if you're going to make that argument, it's so hypocritical now that he loses his job over this when she was going at him. And she's like, if you saw a man half the size of another man mm -hmm. doing that, you'd go, he kind of deserves it. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But when it's a woman now, so, it's like, and we always say feminists want to treat women like children when it suits them. You know, right? that's, a, mm. that's a, but that's a social thing, right? Because legally, there's no difference. Yeah. Like yeah, if a woman yeah. is a man, there's yeah, but no, there's no yeah, difference. What about the damages, though? I mean, if you file a civil suit, you have to show actual damages. Yeah, so that so, means she's going to hit you a couple times, and there's no damages. There's no civil suit. No, yeah, I, mean, but, well, I think we're yeah, discussing social harm, acceptance, yeah, though. Yeah, emotional harm. And in social yeah, there's acceptance, there's harm. no way a woman would lose her job if a video released of her pushing a guy. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, yeah, she's not going to lose her job. But I think it's yeah. more because uh, well, society accepts mm -hmm. that if a... If uh, a woman hits a man like she can't really do damage like I'm um, so you're saying I there's feel, a realism involved fitra right? there's yeah, yeah, yeah. fitra involved but, but, but yeah. there's a difference if like Ronda Rousey you, you guys know who that is right yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like she's if, trained, she, if yeah. she hits her husband like I mean her, that's her, unacceptable her, her hands are actually yeah, considered weapons right? yeah. but today everybody's that's a, that's so inconsistent myth, Huh? That's a, that whole registering your hands as a legal weapon thing. Wait, it's a myth. Are you sure? hundred so, percent. So not a law anywhere. If a boxer, I know. I tried to do it. They didn't accept. It. <laughs> <laughs> if a, wait, if 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 a, if a boxer punches someone, yeah. is, is equal, that's equal to anyone else punching someone? I mean, there might be some high, in a civil suit. There might in a civil suit. There might be some. You know, you're a professional fighter. You should know better. or Whatever. Yeah. You know, you can do more damage. But as a legal thing, it's not It's not like you use the weapon, right? Yeah. It doesn't increase any kind of criminal penalty. You know what I realized um, with uh, my kids are two, or their age is similar, right? Uh, they're 16 months apart. So at some point we were competing. And every single competition, like they would play a, a sport or whatever against each other, and I'd be like the referee. I noticed that in every single situation, uh, this is not going to end up right. If, a, if, if the boy beats the girl, he's sort of like, sort of victorious but sort of not it's a no-win situation and then if he gets beaten it's an utter embarrassment it's a no-win situation in a no so i ended it right i said <laughs> you're not competing against each other anymore right that's why uh, uh boys and girls don't play in the same sport because it's like like even even if you win or you lose it's either way you're sort of looked at although yeah. that could yeah. be transphobic man but i think you were saying that the the fact that a, ma a man can do more damage to a woman than vice versa but generally speaking, that's why it's not accepted would you call that a realism but, but today yeah, real. it is accepted if that man identifies as a woman so it's kind of like there's just no rhyme or reason which happened because in a sport it's where happened I, in a sport where, where they a, let they let men sport. identifying as women fighting sports and they're just setting records beating they actually women. sent one woman to yeah. the hospital some women to the, i mean just there's really? absolutely no yeah. logic yeah there was a, to what's socially a, acceptable there was a, it was in europe so, or america uh man male to female 
a transgender person named Fallon Fox who fought in in, uh, in mixed martial arts. What? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, I gotta and, see this. That's not. And but the worst part is originally, uh, she he was uh, didn't tell anybody that he used to be a man that mm. transitioned, right? And his argument was like, well, I had hormones and that. You know, change my my biological. But it doesn't matter. The muscle mass, the bone density, all that stuff is still yeah, there. Yeah, it's not changing. Plus, I heard somebody, uh, Joe Rogan, the comment who's a UFC commentator, say that you know it's also thirty years of testosterone pumping through your brain. That's true. You just have a different mentality. Oh yeah. Somebody who was born a woman. So. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and the other thing is that like some of these verses, um, I've read um, Dr. Abdul Halim's uh, really amazing book, The Listeners, Themes, and uh, Styles of the Quran, mm-hmm. and. You know, a lot of these verses are just read completely out of the logic of the surah. Like mm-hmm. they'll just, for example, arijalu uh, qawamun ala nisa. Yeah, yeah. That men have uh, an authority over the women. Now, some people protective responsibility over the yeah, women. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people, I mean, especially in Desi culture, they use that verse as like um, obedience, knock, knock down argument for why women are lesser creatures than men, mm. ontologically, right? Wow. Yeah. And the thing is that it's completely out of the logic of the surah because this, that entire page of Surah Nisa is talking about marriage, mm. right? Yeah. And it's talking about rights of marriage, and then, then that verse comes in, yeah. and even in that verse, it's talking about marriage. Oh, so, yeah. Also, this whole thing that yeah. we, this is proof that women are inferior, and then yet that's wh- why are you getting married to one then? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird <laughs> argument true. for a heterosexual no, man to make. Like, <laughs> I've, like uh, I've heard people that like, they'll take their wives to, to Mecca, right? And they won't allow their wives to go to the haram because women have to pray indoors. Oh, that's ridiculous. So it's, that it's sounds, just like... sounds pretty know. deal to me. So yeah. then slavery is the uh, <laughs> uh, next subject. But I All would right. think slavery is actually... Uh, it's more understandable in the sense that, well, it was the entire yeah, world was doing surprised. this. you yeah. Right? And you don't see it happening today. Right? It seems like it's... And Sheikh Noah has a section on that Babel, uh, not chapter, where um, he just has a little paragraph. He says, this is something that its existence in the in the books does not necessitate that it was a pillar and a desirable of our religion and when it has been phased out right we consider that to be a desirable because the prophet just, just to challenge that a bit there yeah um i think if you're talking to somebody that's really bright yeah and understands and, and potentially an academic they can easily push you know kind of uh so take could a, come back take apart that argument yeah because we're not saying some man did this at that time. We're saying somebody that's flawless in what he did. We follow everything he said, and he's divinely guided. So it doesn't matter that it was normal at that time. He did. So the Prophet Sallallahu didn't do a lot of things that were normal at the time because it was against what Allah would want him to do. And you really are kind of you have to get to the point which is it's not condemned. Mm-hmm. It is not condemned, and that's where they get you. Is yeah. okay? Yes, it was done at that time, but people people were worshiping idols. Yeah. And, and the Prophet Sallam never True. did because he's the Prophet and we follow <coughs> everything he does and he's perfect and he's divinely guided. So what he does because of what's done in that time doesn't matter. He needs to stand up across all time. True. But that's not necessarily true. Why? That what that something has to be universal for all times in, like, it in it, application. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be applied, but it means it wasn't immoral. And that is, well, this is the key. Yeah, that's yeah, so the key Dr. to Brown's, this. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's really where if you're talking to somebody that understands and, and has read through it, that's the area where you have to be able to address. Yeah, so that, okay, yeah, it's praiseworthy the free a slave, but where is the a, even a hint of condemnation of in slavery any, itself? In any religion, okay. in any religion, not right. just Islam, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, Ahmed's got the, he's got note cards, man. You you. Got no, there's numbers. <laughs> I see numbers on those cards. <laughs> we got through one so far. <laughs> so the the you know the it's interesting. So I, what I what I find uh, when you look at a couple issues, uh, uh, let's just you know I, I don't even I won't even use the word domestic violence because it's too much of a euphemism. Just say wife beating, right? When you look at wife beating, you look at uh, marriage to young people, child marriage. You look at um, and slavery. These are the three things that people. So let's just say you know, wife beating, pedophilia, slavery. These are the three things that people in our society cannot handle. They cannot handle them. They can't. That guy Milo. Remember Milo? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Milo yeah. said all the crap Milo yeah. said. And that one thing. And that one, Milo says one thing about pedophilia, yeah. trying to like talk about that, and, and he's saying it's legitimate or something. And boom, he says. Listen, before you go on, uh, do you remember when that happened? 
he had went after you the same week. Yeah, I know. I was the last. Remember, victim, I, I was the last victim of Milo. Yeah, Congrats. I'm telling you, he went after him. He <laughs> yeah. went after him. Right now, he knows who not to mess with. <laughs> <laughs> he went after him, and then literally the same week, and I was uh, somehow on um, talking to Omar Suleiman at some point, and I said, "Did you notice like this guy went down like immediately after he started going after?" Uh, Jonathan, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Wally. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, okay, the, but to, to, what, what I find, again, I'm speaking from a, a kind of academic, <laughs> out, you know, looking at this from, uh, perspective of an analyst, right? Yeah. What's interesting? These are the three things we cannot, we can't talk about these things. Mm -hmm. We can't even talk about them because of the emotional. They're so, I mean, people get emotion. They get sick to their stomach. They get emotional. They can't think. Uh, these are three things that were totally normal, totally normal within 100 years, the last, 100 years for ago. For most of human for mo history. For mo first of all, for mm. most of human history, I mean, we have to understand, like people, the idea, like people didn't even criticize the prophet, Ali Sallam, for his marriage to Aisha. People whose like whole life was about yeah. finding things to yeah, criticize so about the prophet in his sex life about Aisha didn't criticize her age until yeah. 1905. Wow. Right? until 1905 because guess what they were marrying young girls at, and two my course. ancestors like every you know uh, in parts of the world today slavery uh, until it still exists even i'm not just talking about like new slavery you know like uh, uh you know like workers Human in the gulf or something like that. i'm talking about just people who are actually property still exist un informally in places like mauritania right yeah. um uh you look at british judges in india uh, dealing with Muslim marriage cases in the late 19th century, early 20th century. What do they say about mu about Muslim men who beat their wives? They're like, this is the same thing our law says. They said this is just like our law. So uh, whether, you know, look at things like um, the, um, you only get like rape reform into like 1970s, 1980s. Yeah. I mean, you look at American law until the 1970s and the use of force against sp a spouse was just, this was not, uh, you know, it was almost like the, we talk about children where you can use you know, reasonable forms of discipline. Yeah. So the, and the things like tort, spousal tort uh, issues. So it's interesting that the things that disgust us, that cause actual physical disgust in us today were things that were totally normal and uncontroversial mm -hmm. uh, a century ago. And even maybe even more recently. And that's because there's a, I really recommend this book. It's called, uh, that's disgusting mm -hmm. about the science of disgust. It's fascinating. Uh, and so disgust is culturally conditioned. This is fast. So what, think about what, what disgusts you. Mm -hmm. Um, I must think, uh, just think in terms of fashion. I don't mean to like belittle this, but think about like, you ever go back and look at a 1990s video or something like, what the hell? No, no. Like, this is you're like, this is ridiculous. You yeah. can't look like this. Yeah. But that's not that wasn't your reaction in the 1990s. That was awesome, right? So yeah, like, that's just the, these yeah. things that seem like all automatic reaction we have. And I always give this example of dog meat. Like if you you know bring plate to a plate of dog meat to any American, they're gonna barf. They're gonna be mm -hmm. disgusted. They're gonna be morally disgusted, physically disgusted, everything. But you uh, you take that to like you know southern China, they're like, oh, that's great, it's dog meat. I was like about to go to the dog meat restaurant, now I don't have to. They have restaurants with dog meat, right? So monkey brain. This is like when we talk about what physically disgusts you. Yeah. Physical disgust. We think that physical disgust is keyed to moral to moral truth, right? So there are certain things that are so bad that may make us physically ill, and that means these things are morally wrong. But in reality, there's actually only one. There's one type of dis so one type of disgust which triggers a certain part of your brain. The other all other types of disgust trigger other related parts of your brain, but not that one part of your brain. It's called the insula. This is immediate family incest. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, what is the only universal taboo? I mean, it's essentially universal between all human societies. The man and his mother. Immediate family incest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Legal in New Jersey. Legal? What? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. It is. Why? Really? It happened. Wasn't it made it legal in Germany? So you guys are so progressive. No, no, no. If there's an adopted. There was a there was a woman who I guess she was estranged from her dad. Didn't realize it was her dad. She fell in love with the guy. They were dating. And then right? they decided to move to New Jersey because it's yeah. legal here. They discovered they discovered that it's my daughter, biological daughter. Like he's a, like a 50 year old guy and he's going out with like a 25 year old girl. Right, and then they discovered, oh my gosh, you're my daughter. But they said, well, let's keep going, and uh, they came to New Jersey and they're together. See, I feel sick now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
See, so I, I all things that are natural yeah. stop at the borders. <laughs> <of the> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, so my, my yeah. point is yeah. that we ne- that's I think one of the biggest points I, I want to I, I try to make in so th- about the issue you're see Ahmed I like Ahmed because Ahmed gets the issue here on slavery issue. So uh, that's right. It's it's actually very for example you know we talk about gender norms a thousand years ago or well like there's all sorts of stuff racism a thousand years ago we'll be like yeah that was wrong but like we don't we don't blame people for the way they treated their wife a thousand years ago like, we're just like that was just normal there's a few things that we we refuse to be historical about one of them is slavery so you see this when you, you like see now people discussing Aristotle or something like Aristotle defended slavery as natural. They'll be like, this is even Scott, like they'll just make a note like this is disgusting, un- indefensible. Like he was to, like, why, you know, why are you like making these, you know, why do you have to feel the need to put this statement in there? Because we can't, if, if you, if you say what we, what I say in the book is one of the axioms that we have in our society about slavery is, is that it's a universal, it's an intrinsic gross moral wrong, which means it is wrong anywhere. It was wrong a thousand years ago, it was wrong 2,000 years ago, it's gonna be wrong 100 years from now, it's gonna be wrong a thousand years from now. So it's always wrong. That's, I don't, I don't think that's accurate. Uh, I just don't think that's how morality works. Mm-hmm. But the point is, uh, if someone, that's not, if, if, you, if you're willing to say that slavery was not wrong a thousand years ago, then you don't have a problem because the prophet had slaves, Islam allowed slavery, but it's not a big deal because it wasn't actually wrong. Uh, the, then the, the other problem is, um, how do you, you take like Joe Muslim, like Saad here, okay? Saad is, I tell him the prophet had a slave, had a concubine. Saad feels disgusted because Saad is an, Amer- you know, an American and he lives in the 21st century and he feels that s- slavery makes him physically ill. Like he feels this is morally repulsive. Okay. So now he's got a problem, which is that he's got this person who's his moral exemplar who is actually morally revolting to him. That is a disaster waiting to happen. That's a d- dilemma. It's literally a dilemma. You cannot reconcile this. And, uh, but it, I, I believe, what I argue is that if you understand, so we can make a very easily and very good all sorts of Sharia arguments for why slavery should not exist, why we should get rid of slavery, why it's wonderful that we've gotten rid of slavery, why we should not allow slavery, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's easy to do. But say this feeling you have of in, immense moral disgust is not because this thing is wrong throughout space and time. It's You're, because this has been a culture. This is how we, to feel that we is, have been taught is, to teach this. To this is this bigger than slavery. This is how someone is determining morality. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. really the key here. And mm. um, I think what drives a lot of what people, if you talk to people and actually push them, they rarely th- ever analyze the why they just know the yeah. what right this is yeah. what we do but they don't know why anyone does anything mm-hmm. and the fact that america has been a superpower and a rising superpower over the last couple hundred years and had the one of the worst if not the worst application of slavery that by islamic sharia would not be allowed islam does not allow you to treat any human being slave or not the way americans in the south treated uh, slavery and since they are the superpower and everyone follows what America says and believes, and they had to distance themselves from this so far that people have this feeling of slavery that they're, they're, they're not, it's not no other topic. You can't even discuss it. And it gives them like everybody now, because America leads in, in, in what comes out thought wise around the world, mm-hmm. uh, uh, which unfortunately plagues the Muslim world, you know, away from, from Islamic concepts. Um, I mean, this is just where you cannot have this moral discussion where you go, okay, yeah. how do you, how do you actually look think, at morality? I think yeah. it, it's really, I mean, I think it's really important to note that the things that we find so, I mean, pedophilia, slavery, wife beating, like these are the, you know, what's going to get even Milo, you know, Milo yeah. defends slavery, he's history. Milo yeah. defends pedophilia, he's history. Milo you know, defends wife beating, he's history. Uh, these are our degree of dis- now again we can make all sorts of very good arguments from an islamic perspective from a western perspective about why it's bad to hit your wife why it's inappropriate to have and and destructive to have relationships with people of, 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 until they've reached a certain level of maturity why exploitative relationships of labor and dependence are wrong we can have those are all we can have those wonderful discussions and all be convinced of, the, of them 
But this feeling, this gut feeling we have these things are wrong. It's, is it coincidence that these things are the things that we feel are in our gut are wrong, but they're also the things that were entirely acceptable not that long ago? Mm -hmm. Because disgust is how a, a culture uh, moves away from something. Affects that change. It, yeah. it's, it's, it's like we're all we're all getting like our society is getting like the super fast super cleanse on these issues. Yeah. Like we're all like in like mega juice cleanse on this. So that's probably the worst example <laughs> you know, analogy. But I mean the point is yeah. that so. You know, I, it was this example in my class all the time. Like, if I were to tell you outside, two blocks away, somebody was brutally murdered. Somebody came, you know, ha actually, I'll do this. A guy went into the embassy. He got strangled, chopped into pieces, and dissolved in acid. Oh, <laughs> you guys are all laughing, right? Yeah. You're like laughing, like, ah, I mean, but we, like, that's wrong in every society. Yeah. This is wrong in every society in human history. Mm -hmm. But if I told you, uh, a 50 year old guy just had sex with a six, six year old or just had six sex with an eight year old. See, now none of you guys are laughing, hmm. right? Cause that's like, Oh, that's like the dog plate of dog meat, you know? But that thing not only was entirely acceptable a hundred years ago in our society, it's entirely acceptable in many societies today. Hmm. So the thing that everywhere is wrong, we're like, ha ha, a guy got chopped up and put yeah, into acid, yeah. you know? Yeah. The thing that is actually, wasn't even a big deal a hundred years ago in our own country. We that's now, awesome. That's a theory of disgust. It's yeah, manufactured. So that's the, the, exactly. It, the thing that is absolutely wrong, we don't yeah. really, we, yeah, we know it's, it's wrong, it's but really, we don't feel disgust at it. Yeah. It's like the manufacturing of disgust. Exactly. And if you think about it, disgust existed, uh, the Arabs actually uh, manufactured, not say manufactured, but that that existed. You see, you see that when it comes to idols, very early in the time of the Sahaba, right, right, right. right? Like it's a way to to break that history, right? That when they talk about idols and false gods and whatnot, you could tell that they're talking about it with that. Whereas today, it's almost like okay, there's an idol at the gas station. Yeah, there's whatever. A, like I yeah. don't care. Like there's so, like a they go into the Indian restaurant. There's the Shiva thing. Yeah, yeah. and actually, I my kids were taught. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in still the, grossed out by that. <laughs> <laughs> my kids were taught. No, th and this is actually something that was re revived. They were uh, in school and they're taught about uh, idols, right? Uh, worshiping false gods. I hadn't heard the word false gods for like ages until the kids learned it in Islamic school, like fourth grade. Uh, for, uh, six years old, seven years old, false gods, right? And I'll, and they're like, wow, false gods. We have to make sure we don't worship false gods. And I'm <laughs> like, well, there's no false gods in the world anymore. And then one time we were driving and they're like, oh, a false god, <laughs> right? And I was like, what are you talking about? We're at the Sunoco, right? Yeah. And I look le right and there's all these statues of these Hindu, Hindu gods, right? I'm like, wait a second, there are a ton of false gods yeah. everywhere, right? And these, mm. these poor guys working at the gas station, they're poor people, right, from India, they actually, you know, revere their gods, right? And I was like, you know what, that actually does exist. And on Route 27, I don't know if you've ever taken it, but there's a really weird group. They're, they're uh, gay Buddhists, and they have, they have the gay flag out, and they have a massive white Buddha behind the house, right? And it's that little temple. Like a right? white color or like a white guy Buddha? No, it's, no, it's a white colored okay. uh, statue of the Buddha, right? You know, with no, with a face and everything. And they're like, wow, that is a massive idol, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, honestly, they're right. They're, they are false gods, right? So this idea of something that we don't worry about for how many centuries the Muslims didn't have to worry about an idol, right? So that, that manufacturing of that disgust for the early Sahaba had a need because his grandmother, his mom, maybe himself was a pagan, right? And they had to move away from it. Yeah, and like you know, you sometimes I it's interesting. You look back at the time, of the, you know, the histories of the Sahaba and stuff. You're like, why don't they? Do, why aren't they talking about their emotions as their idols? Yeah, why aren't they talking exactly, about their greed yeah, as their idols? Why aren't yeah. they talking about their, you know, now because because that wasn't like they didn't have they didn't have that yeah. problem. And, and <laughs> like, also, they're not greedy. And also, like, anyone know. anyone who has kids, you actually be the, the for the listeners out there. If you have kids, you actually do this. When you want your kids to move in a certain direction, you create disgust, right? for certain things that you don't want them to do. AC parents know that very well. <laughs> <laughs> right? You create disgust by showing them, look at the behavior of that kid in the supermarket, right? That's just horrible, right? And you create within him something that he cringes when he sees that type of behavior, someone disrespecting his parents in that respect. You manufacture that. So this idea that disgust is something 
always related to something that we just were doing a century ago, right? It's so true. But th that's why this all comes back to this. It's really a discussion of how do you gauge morality yeah. and what's your compass for it. And mm -hmm. it's one of the most fun conversations oh, yeah. I have <laughs> with, with non-Muslims mm -hmm. or even Muslims yeah. because it's so easy to under, it's so easy to challenge someone yeah. is because they just don't even think about it mm -hmm. like you can even take any mind, topic uh -huh. and start asking them why they believe in that or why yeah. that's right or wrong compared to what a uh -huh. religion like ours can say yeah. and there's just there's absolutely they, they have no compass to, to, they have no bearing to, yeah. to base things on yeah, so dr yeah. brown uh say you get a, a smart interlocutor who goes all right that's great but our society has been able to move past these terrible things and you know your book is forever it's for all times for all people in all places how do you answer somebody who, co who comes with a challenge like that regarding our position on slavery say i'd say that's great i'd say i'd, I'd say uh the prophet salam, look there's no as far as i know and i'm pretty confident in this, there's no religion or philosophical tradition that a is as uh devoted to emancipation as islam there's just, I mean, there's no, there's no, I, I don't, there's just no comparison. I mean, the, even if you were to say that like all the hadiths were made up in the year 1000 and the Quran was made up in the year 900, these documents are obsessed with emancipation. They are obsessed. This is what like, you refer the, to. Even the, I mean, the number of forged hadiths that Muslim scholars say, like, these are forged. These are made up that are about the, the rewards you get for freeing slaves. Muslims were forging hadiths about the aim of freeing slaves so mm -hmm. it's not the islamic scripture from its origin is absolutely uh, obsessed with uh emancipation so the aim of the sharia argument definitely right? i mean but there's that's not a that's not like an mm -hmm. argument that's an undeniable fact that emancipation now there's a difference between emancipation and abolition, and abolition right mm -hmm. okay no society that had slaves and Every civilization had slaves and almost all human society. Now, there's a whole other debate about what exactly slavery is. Let's not even get into it. Let's just say slaves and we'll just use our understanding. Every society that had slaves, no society, no society even proposed the abolition of slavery until the 1700s. Because hmm. there's Let, a Western uh, I, I let, I, So that, that's a great, great question. And I kind of like to push back more if, there's, if it's possible. So let me know if I'm way off here. <laughs> But is it fair to say that, yes, this is for all times, and it may at some point be something that is needed in some certain no, scenario? No, I, would, I wouldn't even say, I wouldn't say that. Like, I would actually, look, like, for okay, example, why, but, why is it that? But I'm saying, like, how isn't slavery as regulated by Islam? How is it any, is it much different or worse morally than putting someone in jail for marijuana? They're not allowed to see their family. They're not allowed to work. They have to work for free. They and have the, to work without pay. And the United States like, so, prisoners so, technically like, are slaves. So, no, but yeah, I mean, but I'm saying like, like so you look at- difference, they would say these prisoners, at least notionally, did something wrong. But I'm saying, so right. maybe when people do something wrong, there may be a mechanism, whatever you want to call it, well, I mean, but this to, is the point to, of, to do this. And this so, is the point of the 13th so, Amendment. So that's, it abolishes slavery except for people convicted of certain And crimes. that's why I'm saying, like, when someone says, but this is supposed to be for all times, you go, well, maybe this could be for the time to deal with criminals. And what do you do with them? This is a way to put them in a way where they're worked and they're right and they're monitored and they're controlled because well, they've done that really way. really bad I, things. I would go. I would go. Or back. is that kind of just, way off base? There's only one way to make a slave, right? Yeah. When he's your enemy in battle, that's the only Islamic crime, way. huh? Islamically. Islamically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Islamic. That's the only crime that would render him to become your slave. That he yeah. waged war against you. Yeah. I mean, and by the way, this is really important. I, and I, I, again, I, this is not like. Jonathan Brown doing some like fluffy revisionist version of Islam. There is no debate that the Islamic, the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet are obsessed with emancipation. Okay, uh, to the point that they will over or will overturn or look past established notions of property of due process for the sake of emancipation. Right. right. Um, similarly, the main routes into slavery in the Near East and globally, even after Islam. Uh, debt, giving yourself into slavery because you're poor, uh, uh, punishment for crime, the the Sharia immediately uh, uh, eliminates these. Immediately, I mean, the only way, according to the Sharia, 
Yes. The only way someone can become, as Dr. Shadi said, is if someone is captured in war. A non-Muslim is captured. By the way, a non-Muslim who's not a Dhimmi, right? A non-Muslim from outside the Darul yeah. Islam yeah. is captured in war. Uh, okay, we're taking a break. Okay. We have yes. we have to take a break because Mongol is in 20 minutes. Okay. Bismillah. Uh, where do we leave off? We were talking about slavery and uh, right after we uh, we broke to pray uh, Asr, and right after we were discussing whether we should even go into the real differences between what is termed slavery in the Islamic context and what uh, what most people know about slavery today, which is, you know, American transatlantic slave trade, chattel slavery. Okay, so I, I think specifically you were talking about, um, and I was going to bring this up later too, but the methods of uh, ingress and egress from slavery and how that was limited. I think that was the last thing you had mentioned. Um, how, uh, and even view that only through um, like prisoners of war could mm -hmm. you even become a slave. Yeah. Um, whether in the past you could have like, you know, debt or some other reason to choose it. Um, but I think that was the last point that you okay, made. good point. Yeah, so I mean, I think that it, it's it's not just important, but it's 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 I mean, it's not just it's factually true and very important, which is that uh, from the very beginning of Islam, from the time of the Quran and the, the generation of the companions, the routes into slavery are restricted to capture of non-Muslims in, in warfare, and. Uh, that the ways out of slavery are magnified and multiplied mm -hmm. in ways that was previously unknown. Other things that are, are really uh, unprecedented in Islam is the idea that the the child, a ch if a man, if a man has a child with his uh, slave concubine, that child is free, has the same social standing as the children of, from his wife and that the woman is freed upon that man's death right and that's why i mean almost all the abbasid caliphs and almost all the ottoman sultans are all children of slave women mm -hmm. Subhanallah. yeah i mean there's just there, there there's uh um, so um the uh th this is re this is re the reason i bring this up is because as i said before islam is an engine of emancipation mm -hmm. in fact it's sort of ironic because Muslims have to keep buying new slaves because they free slaves so much. Hmm. And by the way, so the like, slaves of the Muslims, you could have had a, like brown Arabs. Their slaves were Albanians. Tends to they're be. all sorts of. It was like reverse. All sorts of. Right. You have Indian, European, uh, Turkish, Black African, Southeast Asian, everything. Um, so uh, there's no discrimination. Well, well yeah, sense. actually, they didn't, you know, there was no targeting of. Yeah, one so type, I huh? mean, this is very. I mean. Yeah. First of all, the idea that in that the idea that you would we would so define a slavery as not just associate slavery with but define slavery with and by a certain phenotype like black right or Af you know black African. This is very rare in world history. I mean, slavery is usually not you know rival just, tribes, right? Yeah, you know, you just you can look the same as the guy. You know, yeah. I mean, remember because even someone in your own tribe gets indebted, they become your slave, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, this is the American experience of saying that blackness and slavery are in, inextricably linked. Yeah. This is a very particular thing in world history. There was a culture even in which if you uh, saved someone's life, right, that person became your slave. Yeah, that's a, that exists in the past. Yeah. So the the so for Muslims, Muslims had lots of different groups, lots of different phenotypes or cultures became associated with different kinds of slavery. So, for example, if you were to go, if you're in Egypt in 1300 and you said, you know, um, Mamluk or something, or this would be a Turkic military slave who might, is actually part of the ruling class. Mm -hmm. Or you could, if you said slave woman in uh, Cordoba in 900, it would probably mean a Berber woman. If you said slave woman in uh, Istanbul in 1700, it would be a Circassian woman. If you said slave woman in Mecca in 1500, it could be Ethiopian woman, it could be an Indian woman, it could be anything, right? So, uh, the, the, but the, the, I want to go back to the earlier point, which is that um, Muslims didn't, Islam didn't abolish slavery because no one had thought of abolishing slavery because abolishing slavery was inconceivable to human, to human beings until the 1700s. Industrial revolution. It, essentially, right? Until... It would be like saying, 
we're going to abolish walking or something or like we're going to abolish you know me- any kind of doing work with your hands or cash almost yeah it'd be say. like it would just be like what do you or like abolish money for them yeah. it'd be like it didn't wouldn't make sense yeah see uh, now i want to i want to uh give a contrarian view here um couldn't conceive i mean like the egyptians for example right like they did a lot of uh, big things without using slaves, like the pyramids. So some people how how think, do we know that, though? So, so some people think the pyramids... It's well, a new theory about pyramid builders that the, the, the people that were actually working on it were upper class because of the type of food and uh, artifacts that they found. Maybe and because oh, wait, that pyramid... That's not an argument for that they weren't slaves. It's just an argument for how slaves uh, were equipped. So Okay, but, but, the, but here's I this. Say, let's, yeah, say, let's say this. Let's just imagine that so. these people, that the Egyptian pyramids are built by corvée labor. So basically bunch of peasants who are otherwise free are called in for nine months of hard labor. Mm. There's lots of things that are called slavery in world history. That are, just because you're a, this term, just, there's lots of things that we call slavery in world history that were not permanent. Mm-hmm. That were like, you work one day a week. You work one month a how, year. How about the military drafts? Yeah, I mean, things like, so again, like the, right, this right. is why, I mean, this is, I mean, I, I don't want to get into it because it's so complicated, but exactly what we choose to call slavery in world history is really about our own projection of what we recognize as looking like slavery to us. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's all sorts of relationships that are just as controlling Mm -hmm. and just as and feature just as much domination that we don't call slavery because they just, that just doesn't, that's not how we think about them. I mean, trafficking is not called slavery, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Well, it is now. Finally recognize that. But you're right. The military draft is a great example. Like what, what is that other than slavery for the next four years? I can send you to die. Exactly. Yeah. And to kill others. Yeah. Now and here's you have no freedom of movement. Here's a point now. And the threat of violence if you don't comply. Yeah. 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 yeah of course. Uh, uh, and and the threat of putting you in another form of slavery, which is jail, right? If you're if no, you but, walk so, off, but right? if someone's listening, well, to no, this, but if you resist, they're you get, going you to force oh, you. Yeah. 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 Like it's a, they the way, will, you know, yeah. like arrest you, kill you. Like I, I mean, there's all laws are. Yeah. And so, but the point is, if someone listening to this podcast can be like, that's ridiculous. Come on, that's a joke. But no, but I mean, like that's just because we don't think about, yeah. we don't in, ca- we don't characterize this relationship in that way. Well, one of, and one of the, the the defining points of slavery is the literal control of one's movement. Right now, certain crimes that are committed today, you go to jail for. In Sharia, it will be zulm to now control his every movement and every step because he did that. Right, that's why we have idea concepts of. Um, l- like lashes and striking and whatnot, right? You can you can do that. You can't control his movement and say he has to spend a year outside of his home. But but, but right? uh, Shadi, actually, when you said the defining element of slavery is code, there, there is no defining. That's a, that's there's yeah. a whole industry. I, mean, I don't want to say industry, there's a whole field in study of slavery studies. I'm yeah. just trying to define what slavery like, is. Like yeah, and and prison imprisonment. So example. people would say. There's lots of, for example, a mukatib slave, yeah. mukatib slave, which is a slave in Islam who has a agreement to purchase their own freedom from their master on installments, mm-hmm. right? Those people have very little, Sharia-wise, have very little restriction on their movement. Mm-hmm. There's lots of instances historically yeah. in Islamic civilization where slaves had, they could go and do whatever they want. They were out working for their master. Their master would be like, look, go out and make money. Do whatever, yeah. do whatever you want to do. Go make money and then pay me your installment. Yeah. That person would go out I and mean, do that's, this. That's essentially credit here. <laughs> 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 that's the loan industry. So you, at, that point, at that point, can that's you even call it slavery? This is my... This is my well, that's the, so the, I have that, a question. The problem is you can't... Is, we could sit here. I'm talking yeah. We could sit here for two hours. To ju- define We slavery. could sit here for hours and hours yeah. just trying to define slavery. So I have a question for you. Actually, in fiqh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm not aware. I wasn't aware that the there was any category of abid in which you could not you did not dictate or you could not dictate their movement there is i mean of course in islamic law there's always more than one opinion i mean yeah. there's almost always more than one opinion but what you see in general is uh the mukatabs the, in mukataba there is significantly less restriction than on the non mukatib slave. Yeah. So you can see a, a degree of cha- that, either, either way, there's a degree of change. Now, I want to link, link this up because earlier we talked about the West, Western civilization. At some point, the intelligentsia really had this type of fissure and this break with their past when they realized that they couldn't trust their past. The, the, many of the major institutions that their whole civilization relied upon was based upon lies, right? 
and and that type of thing. Uh, that break, as well as occurring as we speak today, there are buildings now being renamed. There are people who are no longer praiseworthy, including from founding fathers to very early people. And most of it on the issue to slavery, to slavery yeah, yeah. of slavery. So we we're, we now have a point where, which I talked about this in the past, that your real identity is your moral identity who you identify as being good what you identify as being good because now we have a nation where our the founding generation generations many generations of the nation we now loathe because we don't view them as moral anymore we just dis disgusted by them right I, and I it's and, and it's just a matter of time till it gets to george washington who was like uh yanni no. Well, this is what you know. This is the, so the, whole, the, the whole chapter that I think I gave you this chapter four of my book. They, it's actually structured around uh, the, the Charlottesville protests mm -hmm. because yeah. when I was sitting there, this is the irony, man. I couldn't, I could not deal with it. Like these same people who are being like Jonathan Brown is, uh, you know, advocating slavery, everything. The same guys are is saying the exact same thing I was. Like a couple months later, Tucker Carlson and all these people. I was like, look. Um, you have a real problem, right? If you're saying that slavery is evil throughout space and time, it's not just evil. It's the absolute. It's like the worst thing throughout space and time. Yeah. And the person you look up to morally, be it the prophet, or Plato, or Aristotle, or George Washington, or Thomas Jefferson, right? They allowed slaves or had slaves. It, when, like, do the math, man. Yeah. Okay, this, like, explain yeah. to me how this person yeah. is a moral authority for you. Yeah. 250 years ago was a different time. 1400 years ago, uh, same time. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so then they, they, uh, they'll, like, that's what Donald Trump said when that, when they were going to take down that statue of uh, George, Thomas Jefferson. He yeah. said, Are we going to take down the statue of George Washington? Yeah. George Washington's <laughs> like, well, And, the, you know, yeah. like, some people, like, We'll be like, yes, we should take that back to yeah. George Washington. But good luck going out and, and convincing the entire American public that every single thing called Washington in our country, which changed. is pretty much everything in the country, <laughs> has to be changed. Yeah. See, but, but my question is, shouldn't we have a right to be disgusted at the type of slavery that existed in America? Because I mean, as you know, as we all know, that the slaves weren't even considered fully human. Right? And th there's no Islamic scholar that would ever say that a Mukatib slave or whatever is like lesser of a human, like close to a beast or something. So, right? it's a, it's like I mean, I, I, so first of all, like, I'm not a scholar of slavery in America. And like, I don't, I'm not married to George Washington. Like, I don't care. Like, I don't care. George Washington was a bastard. I don't care. Like, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. I mean, he was like, I don't know. These people have no. I, I care about the Prophet, I care about the, the Sunnah and the Quran. Um, Americans, I mean, I'm American, but like, you know, Americans who want to glorify and honor those people, uh, they have to deal with this issue. They have to deal with how those people allowed and were okay with plantation slavery in America. Yeah. That's not my problem. And, and I mean, I condemn, I condemn slavery in America. I, a portion of my estate is going to reparations to African Americans and to Native Americans. I think white people in America, if they're they they owe reparations. I've said this publicly numerous times. But they owe reparations. Wills. Yeah, they owe reparations to African Americans. They owe reparations to Native Americans. And uh, so, I mean, the issue of America. Uh, I'm not trying to like, but like, that's just not my problem. No, I, yeah. I'm just trying to uh, point that out because, again, slavery is not slavery. Like how we define it matters a lot well here's the thing yeah. go this is the second the second axiom in the yeah. chapter go go to a cocktail party well don't go to a cocktail party go to a party <laughs> where people are socializing right and go up to somebody and be like well i mean this slavery is not that bad and just yeah. see what happens to you and i use the example in the in the book of that that the filipino guy yeah. uh alex tison i think and he had this yeah. article my family slave and you know, people were attacking him. You had the slave, and yeah. the Filipinos were like, "No, no, it's not like American." Yeah, yeah. So yeah. go out and try and be like, "It's no, almost no, like no, uh, no, the, no, it's not that bad." It's, it's not like the bad. cook, the yeah. chef, who yeah. said uh, she was shown that her family lineage had twelve slaves. She was like, "That's a lot," and then the the host was like, "You know, it's a lot. One, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's also a lot, but it's also like uh, rape, right?" Yeah, you can't be like, "No, but it's not that. It's not that kind of rape." You, yeah. you say yeah. that your history. You're so you're, Whereas, in fact, yeah. marital rape. When they say it doesn't exist in Islam, we would call it uh, spousal abuse, yeah. right? Because rape involves taking something that does not is not your right. Whereas what they call marital right, rape is actually taking something that's your right in a way that was harmful. 
So you would still be, you would still, there's still issue there. I have a, this is a whole last chapter of this book. The slavery book is on that issue. Yeah. I give, I give lots of cases, uh, court cases and fatwas mm -hmm. where the wife or the uh, slave woman uh, gets, basically gets legal satisfaction by saying that their husband harmed them. So what the, in American law, what we talk about in the, in the sense mm. of consent, Islamic mm. law talks about it in the, through the language of harm. Uh, yeah. 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 So. No, I'm just, my big concern with this is that um, certain things in a certain context might not be that, you know, might not be that egregious. But say, for example, the case with pedophilia or marrying little girls or whatever. In 20th century America, right, you marry a, like a generation X you know, nine-year-old who's, you know, loves Justin Bieber, whatever, like, we would definitely know that getting that person married is just not right. Of course. So, so my, my thing is that, but in a certain context, like, let's say you're, you're a Bedouin in, in Sudan or something, and, um, you've learned you know, all yeah, there you is to, to learn. <laughs> yeah. You don't go to high school or like, uh, you know, no, you're yeah. a nine-year-old girl that's slaughtering sheep, right? Yeah. Um, whereas a nine-year-old girl in America would probably faint, right? Yeah. So in that context, maybe it's not as egregious. But Dude, the thing I'm, is, I'm gonna, and not only that, it's also biological. Amr ibn al-As, and it's in uh, Ibn Hajar's, uh, yeah. his biographies. Amr ibn al-As, and between him and his son, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, is 12 years difference. Yeah. All right. So even, like, so how old was his wife? Yeah. Right. My, my grandmother yeah. was 14 when she had my mother. Subhan. Like, that's just one generation ago. Wow. Where's your family from? Argentina. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. But my point is that, like, cer these certain things that uh, if they are harmful in that context, we should make it. Yeah, of course. But, that, yeah, but, but, but that's, that, that, as I said, if we, had a if we had a Sharia court in America and I went and I said, I want to marry this nine year old, the judge would say, absolutely not. Because what is, what is the age of marriage? Is, uh, you don't marry someone who is at an age where la yujami o mitluha, right? This is it's based on what age do people in your society become sexually active? That's the age at which people becomes you can marry somebody. Yeah, you can't have so if you were to, in America today that we probably put that I I'm just guessing like 16, 17. Probably yeah. this is around realistically this is around the age people actually yeah. socially acceptably start becoming sexually active. So that would be like, and guess, by the way, guess what age people get married in America sometimes, hmm. 16, 17 years old. Hmm. So, I mean, that's what a Sharia judge in America would apply. They'd yeah. say, this is, and if you went and said, I, wait, the prophet married a nine-year-old, be like, look, this, this person, this is Dara, this is not an Ar-Urf. Right. And it, Sharia, the, the Sharia says on these issues yeah. is determined by custom. And also, uh, that, and just another example that inside of marriage itself, if you as a Muslim man today provided what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, exactly what he provided his spouse, right? This by Sharia itself would not be acceptable because that's not the gauge. The gauge of what you provide your spouse is what her peers receive mm -hmm. of the space of her home, the type of uh, food and clothes that she gets, all that stuff that you provide, right? It's by peers. It's so uh, the Prophet himself has established that certain things that uh, th that we would imagine, okay, that's a sunnah, right? He has actually told us no. The sunnah in that case, in that case, is the orf. In other words, what the peers receive. Right. Yeah. And I think the same type of thing can be said about slavery too, because um, there could have been a, a certain time, well, mo for most of human history, that um, where uh, restrictions on a person and making them do manual labor doesn't seem as egregious, right? Mm -hmm. But in... 20th century America, like, you know, if I get into a fight with somebody and they lose, it's like, you're my slave now, right? Yeah. Like, you gotta, <laughs> right? It's just, I mean, for example, during the Bosnian War, and I, I wanted to ask you about this, like, when, when they, um, I think when the, the Bosnians uh, won over the Serbs in a battle, um, they sent a question to, I forget if it was Sheikh bin Baz or... Ibn Uthaymin, this Ibn is in Uthaymin. my book. Oh, it's it's in your book. Did you not? Have, did you read? What it? is it? I didn't get a chance to read. To be honest with you. Oh my god! <laughs> I knew I, I, read okay, I, I read I read like like uh, two chapters. So, so Ibn Uthaymeen, they pages. asked they asked Ibn Uthaymeen. Yeah. Um, you know, told me Yasser Qadi told me this. He yeah. heard Ibn Uthaymeen say this to him, yeah. him Allah, which is that they asked him like, can you can we basically take slaves from the Serbs? And he said, it's allowed. It would be. It's like it's not. It's not allowed, but not because it's wrong in Islam. It's not allowed because it would be disastrous PR. Mm.
basically it would be politically disaster if you, if you did this politically incorrect almost. yes it would be very politically incorrect i mean that was very astute because look at look at one of the biggest pr nightmares that isis had besides you know i think it was an intentional PR. isis is isis is insane man i swear <laughs> to god that you couldn't make up bad guys yeah, like i know this. <laughs> I, like, I don't i don't i don't believe the cia made up isis but like i swear to god like, it's like as if someone sat to sat down with like we want to come up with the ultimate muslim villains yeah like yeah. i'm like, gonna have we're gonna have like movie. the jumps the Slaves. orange jumpsuits <laughs> yeah. and like no, you know no, they're exactly like cobra you know they're, yeah. they they yeah. have no national borders yeah. they're, it's like you know they get weapons and money from who you knows know the where. difference is cobra commander was really funny yeah he was hilarious <laughs> that guy was there's like some good youtube clips somebody like put together all the good cobra commander <laughs> lines i actually never saw that that was before yeah. my time yeah. See, uh, see yeah, but my, but my, was again, my, what was that? Low eighties, yeah. late eighties, no, early eighties. I mean, late eighties, early nineties. Really? Yeah. I can't remember that. Yeah. You're not that much younger, man. <laughs> <laughs> see again, but my concern is that, uh, like, I would argue. I mean, uh, uh, my opinion doesn't matter, right? But I would argue that, like, taking slaves now would be, uh, would be much more. Uh, it would cause more harm than any type of good that you could get out of it. Yeah, and, definitely. And also, there's no. By the way, how? I mean. Legally speaking, as a Muslim, there's no way to take a slave. I mean, how there's no dola to rage a war. You can't go place. fight. Who are you going to go fight on on behalf of whom? What futuhats? Yeah. yeah no see, futuhats. but the thing is, in Muslim societies, you know, even in Ottoman societies, even before then, you had slave markets with people, and this is from your chapter. Okay, um, so where are you going to buy the slaves then? Uh, well, not that I, I want to buy slaves. I'm saying that. No, I'm not saying. Were, obviously, you don't. But I'm just yeah. saying, like, it's just. Uh, it just uh, it's obsolete no but listen remember we were talking one time we were, we were walking in istanbul uh on one of those trips that we took with that group and we were laughing and saying you know imagine the whole world changed right and all this technology suffered something right mm -hmm. okay uh we would like look back and laugh at some of the discussions we're having today right for sure Okay. I but call you, it the Mad Max scenario. Yeah. <laughs> now, you just said, as we were going for Salah, that Aristotle said that slavery would cease to exist the moment that, what did he say, spin wheels move themselves? Yeah, or like whatever. looms or spinning wheels when they okay. spun themselves. Yeah. So, uh, let's say in a hypothetical, I mean, technology is becoming, you know, yeah. everything's going to be computerized in a, in a generation, right? The computer is going to be as ubiquitous as a light bulb, right? So, the chips, I mean. So, uh, let's say hypo in a hypothetical world where all that came to a, a screeching halt through a war or Not something like that. Okay. It's possible. It's in the realm of possibility. Yeah, solar flares. Like yeah. Naked pulse, right? yeah. You or think they're still going to be rich people. They're going to be rich people. You think they're going to work? Right. They're going to bring it back. They're going to bring slavery back. So there's, this is, okay. this is a really, I mean, this is, this is a really hard discussion for people to have because mm -hmm when you once you accept the idea that something is absolutely morally wrong and that, that it, it disgusts you so much you can't even yeah. deal with it right mm -hmm. yeah. the the idea that it would come back it's just it's uh, it's like um it's just a, it's like a moral betrayal to even discuss that yeah right um and it's very hard to do and that's why i i think that you just you know you have to kind of i'm a scholar and i i believe the job of scholars is to, is to talk about things that are serious uh, and sometimes those things are hard to talk about but yeah I mean if you if slavery disappeared For in humanity as a, as a legal phenomenon um, when human beings had sources of energy that allowed them to move objects mm -hmm. that, without animals and humans to do it yeah. okay uh, if there is not a source of energy to do that human beings will turn to animals and other human beings to move objects. That's it. And I'm not saying it's a good uh, thing, but it's a reality. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's not... Um, we wouldn't want it. I mean, we might end up being those slaves. Yeah, right? I mean... But, so it's not, but, it's but, not a fun thing. By the thing, way, this, but, is very, <laughs> this is very important to know. Yeah. Slave revolts, Spartacus, the Zand Rebellion, yeah. until the early modern period, until, the, until abolitionism emerges as an idea in the 1700s. It's, it's a little bit earlier, but until it becomes like really kind of uh, echoes a lot in the 1700s. These slave rebellions, like you watch the movie Spartacus. Mm -hmm. This movie is, I mean, I love Kirk Douglas, but this, the Spartacus and his slaves were not fighting to end slaves, slavery. Mm -hmm. yeah. They took their own slaves. They yeah. just didn't want to be slaves. Yeah. Same thing with the Zand Rebellion. <laughs> so that would yeah. be like, you know, the Zand Rebellion. I hate these uh, anachronistic things yeah. in movies yeah. like the Bilal cartoon, yeah, yeah, which yeah. Uh, they have him with cornrows, number one, right? 
Bilal. They made a cartoon for Bilal. Yeah, I, didn't, I saw that movie. I, I did not I imagine that it was the Sahabi Bilal. I wouldn't have Listen, like. He didn't have Egyptian. cornrows. You're Egyptian. They had cornrows back then, <laughs> all the way back and, to ancient Egypt. And and he's fighting, and then he's like standing up for empowerment and liberty. I'm like what? That was horrible. So that's that's an interesting movie. I, I watched it on the airplane. And yeah. I, first of all, I thought it was I was actually better than I expected. But what's very interesting about that movie is that the argument that the central argument in the movie is that he learns from his mother that the real chains are on your heart yeah and that slavery is about your own mentality mm -hmm. not about whether that they're chains in your hands or you're owned by somebody this is interestingly this is actually a very common argument that is, originates from the stoic philosophers mm -hmm. and christianity adopts it and islam adopts it, especially in sufism yeah. it doesn't adopt it in islamic law or in islamic ethics it adopts it in sufism you see a lot of discussed sufis that say like you know that the slave a free man is a slave as long as he desires things mm. and a slave is free as long as he's content mm. and uh but what, what i found interesting about that movie is that the argument the kind of the way that it deals with slavery is fun is is fundamentally not indigenous to the islamic tradition mm. which is a big i mean is a big flaw but the problem is and i've talked about this with a lot of muslim scholars in the u.s you know you can't tell Muslims, you have to tell them slavery was always wrong in Islam. You, they can't handle anything other than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can say... Well, we have, a, no, we have a problem if people can't hear certain things. So, I mean, it's in, it, is, it is entirely accurate. It is a, it is a entirely accurate statement to say that Islam was an unprecedented engine for emancipation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also a very good argument to say that once it becomes conceivable to just abolish slavery as a phenomenon, the logical way to maximize emancipation is to end the phenomenon of slavery. Right. That's in, that is 100% correct. Mm -hmm. But it is also undeniable that for many centuries, from the time of the prophet until you know the 1800s, yeah. uh, it was not morally wrong in the eyes of Muslims, in the eyes of the people that we look to as authorities, yeah. it was not morally wrong for someone to be the raqiq of another person. Yeah. And I'll close with this because we got to wrap up, is that uh, this idea that really bo always bothers me uh, when we have something in Sharia or stories of the prophets and, and people sort of have an emotional wall that okay if this is mentioned what you, you're going to like lose all your iman, you're going to lose your faith, you're going to leave Islam. Right at that point, we actually need to not discuss that point. We actually need to go back to why is it that we believe in a, what do we believe in the first place, right. right? And one of these things is cannot always solely be done intellectually, mm -hmm. right? As Allah Taala when He states, mm -hmm. "Worship your Lord until yaqeen comes to you," which means death or actual yaqeen certainty. Right. So that's why we, I always encourage, and on this podcast, we always encourage much ibadah, right? Like the 12 Nawaf is an amazing ibadah. The 12 sunnahs a day for those who are like present, right? And then in other words, when you're traveling, you have options, but you should at least keep Fajr and Witr and Shaf and Witr, right? When you're sick, okay, as well, at least keep Fajr and Shaf and Witr even sitting, right? But we encourage a lot of ibadah a day. And to question ourselves, where, where are we in the Quran, right? Like how many, have you recited something from memory? Okay, it's Imam Haddad talks about how makruh it is to only recite, we do this all the time for like months on end until we catch ourselves, reciting salah with only kawthar and nas and ikhlas, short surahs like that. He says, that's wrong. Why don't you go to Shams? Prophet Sallallahu said, go to Shams, go to uh, Al-Layl, wal -lay, uh, wal right? The little bigger surahs. That ibadah and that presence in the masjid, right? When that outweighs your presence with bad company, and bad company we consider that, who, what do we consider bad company? Uh, those people who don't remember Allah. In other words, who don't pray, right? We consider that bad company because the Quran itself says, don't obey those, man arad an dhikri, right? Those, don't obey those who don't remember me, right? And when that outweighs that company, the iman starts to grow. And once that iman grows, it's the who is saying this becomes so big the what is he saying if he's a given i'll accept whatever because it's allah right mm -hmm. so that's where the there comes a point where this discussion almost has to like 
like you said, when so when some people reach that point where I can't hear that, I can't even take this. At that point, you don't bring it up, right? Because it, it will break his back, the back of his iman, the backbone of their iman. But he needs to go to another discussion, which is why do we believe in Allah? Why do, what are the rational proofs of the Prophet? And then let's do things like go into masajid. You cannot, we don't divorce knowledge from devotion. And if it is, it's a big problem. So I'm saying this because I sort of view myself sort of on the front lines. Like we're sort of on the front lines where we're dealing with people every single day and you're sort of in the lab. Yeah, I'm not on the front lines. Yeah. That's, for, that's for sure. You're in the lab. He, he makes the weapons. You no, know, I, I, I was know. thinking, subhanAllah, he does make the weapons, right? <laughs> and we use them. And he and I was thinking, like, when you said, I got these fatal, I was like, subhanAllah, where did you, where, which, which libraries were you going to to get these resources? And I was like, I'd never have time for that anymore, right? I maybe did in the past, but I would never have time for that. So I need, uh, there needs to be people who are uh, in the labs and there needs to be people on the front line. So with that, I mean, we really appreciate you coming. We're going to the master right now for the talk in the evening, which they're setting up right now, sure. which is going to be mesh a lot critical. Uh, obviously, when this podcast gets released, that'll be done by now. And you could probably check it, inshallah, on uh, YouTube or check something. it on my Facebook page or on YouTube, however we get it. Uh, so any, does anyone have any closing comments? Uh, you can make them real I, quick. I have something. Yeah. Uh, one, I think one of the big things for me uh, in approaching the, the Islamic tradition was removing the suspicion about the process, right? Because um, I've noticed I deal with a lot of youth, right? So the process does not appear as a personality to them. It's just like somebody, right? Yeah. From world history. Yeah, um, right. But for for um, for a lot of us here on this table, the process it's almost like a person that we know, mm -hmm. right? It's almost a person that we trust. I think that removing that suspicion out of the process some is some is something critical in approaching the, yeah. the hadith literature and also you know yeah. um, anything and we have a exactly. uh, uh, next gen safina's uh, track for kids the bulk of it is sira shama'il wait like you could learn to pray later you you're bringing pre people who you know they're all, maybe they're public school kids right and they ready when we were in public school it was like little bad things like that were became normal, like maybe a little bit of attitude. Public school kids today are on issues. They discuss issues. They have they have like moral issues are things. And I'm wondering, like, don't you guys watch basketball? Don't you do something like fun? It's like they're on issues, right? That's what's so. And these issues r relate to beliefs, right? So we got to go to the foundation, and that is love of. God and his prophet and constant exposure to ibadah and dhikr. Like little bits of exposure on a regular basis. I'm really alarmed by people who aren't Muslims who do not attend a masjid at least once a week. Right? We should be alarmed by that. We should try to change that condition. If we see people like that, yeah, change it. And and un unfortunately sometimes their masjid is no good to go to. And they may be perfect people they, with perfect intentions. But they still need a motivator. Right? So, and that's the scary part. So, well, with yep. that, Dr. Brown, we want to thank you for well, coming I, and for giving us your time. I, I, yeah, please. Sorry, one thing I want to say. I mean, I, I think it's because uh, inevitably there's going to be, you know, obnoxious Islamophobes who sit and listen to this and then write down. I mean, we this discussion of slavery, you know, we all we all condemn it. We all are uh, happy that slavery doesn't exist. None of us would want it to exist again. You know, we're trying. I think it's the obligation of all people. You know, every every religious and philosophical tradition accepted condoned defended slavery uh until the relatively recent past i think it's you know this is our discussion is an attempt to try and like figure out what this means for the present so i yeah. think that's uh of course people who have nasty intentions and want to go and like take one line out of our talk and uh, they're not going to care about this qualifier but i think that's an important thing to it's to, an important thing and and and, and uh, there are some it really immature even most muslim youth right who sort of fantasize because they read a sheikh so-and-so he had uh, this many uh, amma, uh, right whatever and they imagine this is a wonderful thing right his shahwat are talking like his his his, his temptation his temptation think of this this fun or something but uh i always tell him you know what if slavery came back in the world you would most likely be a slave right <laughs> because you're not the superpower of the world right yeah so think about how about this well, well your daughter gets taken as a slave your mom gets it it's, it's all so when if slavery was to come back in the world it would come back for everyone not just for the muslims right all right it would be a global phenomenon we would not end up on the 
better end of the stick. So. And, and honestly, if anybody is listening to this, uh, hears this podcast, and their intention was to find something to pull out and make some negative comments about it, you know, I just stop for a second if you're a really honest and genuine human being and just, you know, maybe consider becoming a Muslim. It'd be better for you. Yeah, yeah I just mean. Just constantly attacking the Muslims. Yeah. So, and I mean that sincerely. These people don't, I don't think they've ever actually thought about it and, reali- and, and, and internalized just the harm that they're doing to themselves by mm-hmm. challenging God's word on earth. It's mm-hmm. stupid for them. And so I feel bad for them. So That's inshallah, the, more, yeah. at least one of them will consider it and maybe come around. Yeah. It's happened before. Mm-hmm. So okay. you still have a chance, buddy. Yeah. Jazakum Allah khair, guys. Bye.